Greetings, everyone. This is Fred Coulter. Welcome to Church at Home. Church at Home is sponsored by the Christian Biblical Church of God, and we are dedicated to restoring original Christianity for today. Now, we finished up on repentance. Now we need to follow up with walk in newness of life. So let's come back to Romans the sixth chapter and let's understand something. That in order for there to be forgiveness of sin, there must first be repentance, and then there must be baptism, and then there must be the laying on of hands to receive the Holy Spirit. Then you come under grace. Then you have to walk in newness of life. So let's read what Paul wrote here, Romans the sixth chapter, verse one. What then shall we say? Shall we continue in sin, that is, have a life transgressing the laws of God? Now, many times you hear establishment preachers say you've got to repent, but they never tell you that sin is the transgression of the laws and commandments of God. And that's where all the trouble comes from. And that's why people are in difficulties, because they're living in sin. And those who belong to the establishment Christianity say, so that grace may abound. No! Grace does not come unless there is repentance and forgiveness. And grace does not remain if you continue to sin. And here's why. Because the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and what he did to be that sacrifice for the sins of the world is greater and far more than what people have supposed. Now, Paul explains it right here. He says, once again, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? May it never be. We who died to sin. Now, how do you die to sin? That's the question. They never explain. And they have a little formula where you don't have to be baptized, which is a lie because everyone needs to be baptized when they truly repent to God. And sin is a transgression of the law. So he says, we who died to sin, how shall we live any longer therein? And that's the way most people live. They live a life that seems right to them. And whatever good they do is their own good. That's not the goodness that comes from God, as we will see. So Paul says, Are you ignorant that we, as many as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? So baptism has great meaning. Number one, you're declaring that you want your past sins forgiven and buried in the watery grave. Number two, that your way of living in sin is going to stop. In other words, you're going to stop breaking the commandments of God. Now, we'll see how good the law really is when we understand it. Because the establishment Christianity says that the law is a curse. Well, we will find out that's another lie. Because the truth is, sin and the penalty of sin is the curse, not the obedience to the commandments of God. Now, we'll see that. Let's continue. 
Therefore, we were buried with him into the baptism, into the death, the death of Jesus Christ. So what this means is the very death of Jesus Christ his crucifixion, his scourging, his beating, his shed blood, and the stripes he took upon him to forgive sin applies individually to everyone who repents and is baptized. You're declaring you're no longer going to live in sin. You're going to walk in newness of life and we will show you what that is. We were buried with him through the baptism and to the death, so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, in the same way we should also walk in newness of life. That is, we who have been baptized. And once you've been baptized, you are to continue walking in the way of God, and we will define that very clearly. So here's the ultimate goal of it, verse 5. For if we have been conjoined together in the likeness of his death, and that's through baptism, can't come any other way. You can't say, oh, Lord Jesus, I repent, forgive me of my sins, and you enter into my heart and all is forgiven, and I'm on my way to heaven, hallelujah. That is a lie. It sounds truthful, but it's not. Because you're not being told the real truth. Now let's read verse 5 again. For if we have been conjoined together in the likeness of his death, Meaning, you, your body, the whole you, had been placed on the death of Christ through baptism. So this is a big deal and a most important thing to do. Now, let's come back to Romans, the second chapter. Let's read verse 13. Now, this is a verse that establishment Christianity will never read because it has a great deal of meaning. Now listen to what it says. Because the hearers of the law. That means you say, oh, I understand about the Ten Commandments, but we don't have to do that anymore. You heard the law, right? But notice, because the hearers of the law are not just before God. So you think you've had your sins forgiven. You think that you're in right standing with God. But that's not so. Because that's not in newness of life. And we are to walk in newness of life. That means going the way of God. Now, let's read the rest of this sentence. But the doers of the law shall be justified. Meaning that if you don't repent of breaking the laws of God, which is sin, and you hear the law, and you don't do the law, you can never be justified and you can never receive eternal life. Now, let's come back here to Romans 7, verse 7. What then shall we say? Is the law sin? No. The law is not sin. But the law tells us what sin is, that if you don't do the law, you are sinning. The law is not sin, neither is the law a curse, because the curse of the law is transgression of the law. Verse 7 again, what shall we say? Is the law sin? May it never be. But I had not known sin 
except through the law. That's the only way you can know what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is evil, what is love, what is, is not love, what is truth, what is lying. The laws of God define it. So he says, furthermore, I would not have been conscious of lust except that the law said, you shall not covet. So the law also has, as we will see, to the inner workings of your mind. Now verse 8, but sin, having grasped an opportunity by the commandment, worked out within me every kind of lust because apart from law, sin was dead. In other words, where there is no law, there is no sin. And Paul made that very clear. So he says this, I was once alive without law. That is the true knowledge of law. Now he was a Pharisee, he was a Jew. He was totally righteous in Phariseeism, and yet, because he was living by all the traditions of the Pharisees and the traditions of Jewish law, rather than God's law, he was alive in the flesh without law. That is the true knowledge of law. But after the commandment came, sin revived. He could see because of the laws how bad sin really was. Then he said, and I died. Now how did he die? by water baptism into the death of Jesus Christ. I died, and the commandment which was meant to result in life, I found to be unto death for me. Why? Because he was transgressing the laws of God, and he was keeping the laws of men. And the commandment which was meant to life was found to be unto death for me because sin, having taken opportunity by the commandment, deceived me. He deceived himself because he thought he could do everything his way rather than God's way. Deceived me and killed me. Now, when the curtains of blindness are pulled back from your eyes and your mind, and you see the law for what it really is, then here's what you will find. Verse 12, therefore, the law is indeed holy, and the commandment holy, and righteous, and good. Now we're going to see that we need to keep the law. And we're going to see there is no eternal life without keeping the commandments of God. So he amplifies it here then. Now then, did that which is good become death to me? May it never be. But sin, that's what God wants all of us to understand. The breaking of his laws and commandments are sin. But sin, in order that it might truly be exposed as sin in me, by that which is good, was working out death, because he could see the penalty of sin working against him, bringing death. And that's why baptism is a death and burial of the old self. So that, by the means of the commandment, sin might become exceedingly sinful. Now, when you come to that point, and you see, and you examine your life, as we have said how many times with the Ten Commandments, and you will find that, as James wrote, if you break one of the Ten Commandments, you have broken them all. 
one of the biggest commandments that is there, right smack in the middle of the Ten Commandments, where it says, and you've heard me say this how many times, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now then, men cannot come along and change the laws of God. Now, they may claim they they have authority to, but that's not true. They may claim that it needs to be changed because we're living in a different age. That is not true. Human nature is the same. Now, let's look at some things concerning the law. Psalm 19. Now, this was written by David. And King David's going to be in the kingdom of God. Resurrection's going to come. And with all the saints, he will be raised as well. So let's pick it up here in verse 7. Now let's understand this. Every word of God is true. Every word of God is holy. Every word of God is what God is going to judge each and every one by. Not good intentions, not good feelings, but actuality of what you do. Now, let's read it here. The law of the Lord is perfect. Now, why don't you stop and think about that for a minute? How can men honestly say, in the name of Jesus Christ, that the law is sin, that the law is a curse, that the law is evil. They can't honestly say it because they are liars. I've been in church my whole life, and all it's done is convince me that I'm completely incapable of doing the things that God says under the law, that if I were to interpret the law to say that if I do these things, I'm righteous, I'm completely incapable of doing them. In fact, the more I try to do them, the worse I get at them. And I found that to be true. That's the whole do not enter analogy. You know, put do not enter on a door and everybody wants to go in. Because the moment you tell somebody they can't do something, that's the only thing in the world you want to do. There's a lot of stuff that you go, God says, don't do this. We go, hmm, I wonder why God doesn't want me to do that. That's an interesting thing. There must be something fun in there, that, uh, something enjoyable behind that door that I'm not supposed to see. There's a little bit of that. Actually, there's a lot of that in the law. Wow, he doesn't justify people who keep the law. He justifies people who can't keep the law, who believe on Jesus. And this is why tears fill our eyes when we think about Jesus. And this is why the gospel is still good news in the world today. Because God broke the law for love. I said to every sinner, God broke the law for love. And furthermore, No man has the power to change the laws of God to make them fit whatever they desire. And Sunday keeping and holiday keeping is exactly what men have done. Now, you write for our book, Occult Holidays or God's Holy Days, which, because that is an eye-opener, because you see, Millions and millions of people are living in sin and deception of Satan, the devil, and the twisting of the scriptures. And that all centers around the laws of God, the commandments of God. Now notice, verse 7 again, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul, giving life to you, true life from God. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Amazing. And the testimony is whatever God says. The precepts of the Lord are right, restoring the heart. What are some of the precepts? Some of the precepts are the holy days of God. Maybe you've never heard of them or haven't heard of them or looked into them. 
So that's why you need to book occult holidays or God's holy days, which. Now notice this one here. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. That is, giving you true understanding of life. Now notice, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever, all generations, all through time. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. Now, I want to ask you a question again. Does any of this sound like the law is a curse? How did these religionists come up with such an idea that is completely contrary to the Word of God and profess that they represent God? Now, I know for some it may be a little confusion because in the King James it says the wages of sin is death, and yet in the Mirror Bible it says the rewards of the law is death. Well, how do you hook that together? Well, first of all, understand the devil is not trying to get you to sin. He's just trying to get you to keep the law. Because if he can get you to keep the law, you will sin. Uh, you see, Romans chapter 7 says, For without the law, sin was dead. There is no sin without a law. There's no transgression of a speed limit if there's, first of all, not a law that gives you a limit, a speed limit. So without the law, there is no sin. Without the law, sin will have no opportunity. And what many people think, they think Satan's trying to get you to sin. And Satan's trying to tempt you to do this or to do that. No, no. All he's trying to get you to do is to keep the law. They cannot represent God. Now notice. More to be desired than gold, yea, much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Now notice the purpose of the law. And this agrees with what we read in what Paul wrote. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Huh. Great reward in keeping the laws of God, not a curse. You really want the truth of God? Do you really want to understand it? Do you really want to be saved from your sins and receive the Spirit of God so that when Christ returns at the resurrection, you will be resurrected and changed into being a spirit being? Now, that can't happen without the laws and commandments of God and the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is truth. And the Word of God is truth. And Jesus Christ is the Word of God. And he is also, we will see, the truth. Let's see something else. Verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Oh, cleanse me from my secret faults. Now, that's what people don't like. But remember this. God knows every thought, any time he needs to. What secret faults do you have? What secret sins do you have? That's why the sacrifice of Christ is so important for the forgiveness of sin and why the keeping of the commandments is the way that we need to be. Let's come to John 14. You probably heard this quoted by establishment religious Christianity presenters and pastors and so forth. But let's read this because this tells us the whole summation of everything. Verse 6, John 14, Jesus said to him, I am the way, 
So the question to you is, do you know the way? Do you know the way of God? You can't know it separate from Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, not a way. That's different. I am the way and the truth. Is that what you really want? Do you really want the truth of God to convict you of your sins so you can repent and be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit of God? That's what it's all about. And the life. This means there is no other way, there is no other truth, there is no other way to life. Now notice the rest of this right here. These are the words of Jesus. So if you want salvation through Jesus Christ, you better believe his words, right? Can you just pick and choose what you want and say, Lord, I'm so smart and good, I'll do this. But this over here, I don't like that. Okay? What is it that you want to keep? A little thievery, a little adultery, a little idolatry, a little other gods before you, uh, hatred. You, you want to keep those things, all transgressing the laws of God? No one comes to the Father except through me. Can't do it any other way. Now, these things are important. You need our book, Occult Holidays or God's Holy Days Witch. You need our book on water baptism so that you understand it completely. You need our book, Lord, What Should I Do? Because you need to understand what God wants. And it's just not a simple little emotional thing that you go through and everything is made right. It is profound. It is deep. It is emotional. It is being laid right on the sacrificial body of Jesus Christ, conjoined to his death. And that's the only way you're going to come to God. So once again, thank you for inviting me into your home, and may you order all of these books. We send them to you free, no cost. We'll get them to you so you can look at what the Word of God is, and you can look at your life the way God wants you to see it, so you can come to repentance and be made right before God through baptism and receiving the Holy Spirit of God. So once again, thank you for inviting me into your home. So until next time, this is Fred Coulter saying, so long, everyone. Thank you.